The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello, I'm David. Welcome to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. Today, I'm joined by two phones, a 2013 Nexus 5 smartphone and a 1988 1G car phone. I think we should probably start with the more modern smartphone. Um, I think more people are likely to have seen inside one or know what to expect. So it will give us a fair basis for comparison when we're comparing it to the old tech. The first thing we have to do on this phone is take the SIM tray out. And like a lot of modern smartphones, if you push the pin in the side, now it pops the SIM tray. Now, thankfully, the uh, 2013 Nexus 5 predated the trend for gluing everything completely shut, so we can at least snap the back off. And in theory, at least, had some user serviceable parts inside. You could buy replacement batteries. I wouldn't suggest it was an easy plug and play activity, but it was at least possible. There we go. Right, so first thing, now we're in the back. You can see that, obviously, you've got the main body of the phone with everything in it but on the plastic back of the phone, you've already got a handful of contacts. And in this case, you've also got the vibration motor for the feedback. I think what surprised me is just the number of antennas though. Here you've got four contacts. Now they'll actually supply the NFC or near field communication, but you've also got two more there which do uh, wireless charging. This was one of the first phones to come with wireless charging built in. Uh, it's got two GSM adapters. GSM, for anybody that doesn't know, is a sort of a generic way of referring to mobile networks. It doesn't make any indifference as to whether it's 1G, 2G, 3G, so on. It just says it's a mobile network. So we've got two mobile network antennas and one over here that's actually labeled, very handily, GPS. So all the antennas are tiny. They're less than an inch. And I seem to remember an antenna is roughly half the size of the wavelength of the radio wave it's designed for. So that gives an indication of the sort of wavelength. Uh, we obviously know that Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, which is the 2.4 gigahertz, um, down here is about an inch in wavelength, something in that sort of field. So a half inch antenna is about right. Um, so at the bottom, I've just taken off this panel and there are again some contacts in here which supply the microphone, which is built into the bottom corner there. Building up a nice collection of very, very small screws. Uh, and this is just some chassis. It's got the cover for the camera lens on it, but otherwise it's an inert piece of plastic. So now we can start pulling off the battery connector. So the bottom board has the charging connector, which is, I'll be honest, disgusting, full of absolute rubbish. And there's actually a second one. I think this has got the display driver on it as well, which is why you've got this quite wide ribbon with a good number of connections on it. Uh, and the screen and display driver is at the bottom of the phone. So on this main board is principally the system on a chip, which contains the RAM, the processor, uh, and everything functionally needed to make the phone work. The only thing that's separate from memory is the main storage because you can have various models uh, and the cost is lower to put that separately on the PCB. Also integrated onto the main board, we've got this little um, IR gate, which is the proximity sensor, which knows when the phone is up against your head. Uh, in really low light, if you look really closely, you'll always spot uh, a little infrared LED, which just shows up as a tiny pink glow. We've got some of these switches for volume and on off on board as well. But because everything's integrated into that single package, there's really not a lot to see. There is the camera module, which I think we're gonna have to take out from the other side. Uh, speaker, headphone jack, and the front facing camera's on its own little daughter board as well. Tiny little camera module. I don't think this is a very high resolution one, but just the envelope which, which they can get a lens and a, a sensor in is just incredibly small. Uh, I can feel how strong that magnet is behind the speaker. It's actually pulling my screwdriver in, I don't know. <laughs> very strong little magnet. Considering that that has eight antennas, the ability to connect to wireless networks, Bluetooth, 
GPS, wireless charging, near field communications, GSM, whatever on earth the additional three antenna at the bottom, which I haven't worked out what they are yet. Uh, it's got two cameras in it, the ability to do so much and fits into that tiny package is just mind blowing. So the question is, how does that compare to the 1988 equivalent of 1G phone? I don't know why, but for some reason, I think this is the coolest thing. Uh, and I was desperate when it showed up and it had a four pin plug on it to plug it in and get it working. Now, I obviously knew it was never gonna work. The, mo the 1G mobile networks all got turned off at the very latest in 1992, but I really wanted to see what it would do if we powered it on. I struggled for a very, very long time to find any information I could on the internet on what this four pin connector was for. I will tell you three of the connections now. There's 12 volt permanent, 12 volt switch, so it knows when the car is active, ground, and I, I'm gonna hold back on the fourth connection. But either way, the ground, the live, and the permanent live, I connected them all up and did manage to get it working. Obviously, all it did was turn on, show me the screen. But if you look really carefully now, you might just be able to work out what that last core is for. The other thing that I really wanted to know was more about the spec of this. And what I ended up finding out was not a lot, to be honest, documentation on these seems to be very scarce, but these are two completely separate units. Different car manufacturers and different car phone suppliers created their own handsets, but what this doesn't have is any RF equipment in it. All of the radio frequency communication is done in this box, and this box was almost ubiquitous. It seemed to be on every single one, regardless of what handset was attached. Um, I've not seen anybody take one of these apart before. I don't imagine there's a lot to look at, but uh, we're only gonna find out by having a look. I've no idea why I find this device so interesting. Uh, it's, it's not even like I have a living memory of these being the in thing. Uh, the earliest phones I can remember my dad having uh, was the, I think it was one of the first Motorola flip down things where the SIM card was actually the size of a credit card and sort of stuck out the bottom. And I do remember if you even slightly touched it, it ruined the phone. Now, me being a child at the time, I'm not going to say how many times that happened, but more than once. Oh, okay, I hadn't really expected the, the back to come off. It's a bit confusing with the numbers and screen on the opposite side that you'd hold your head. It makes me want to call it the back and the front at the same time. Don't know if anybody else feels that way. So right at the bottom, we've got the microphone and a nice modular cable for the RS-232 comms. Wow. Look at the size of the speaker on that. I don't know why that arrangement of perforations for the speaker really remind me of old landlines, but then I guess this being the first generation of mobile phones, they've probably got more in common with landlines than anything else. So not a huge amount to see on here. We've got a few integrated circuits. Um, on one side of the board, a load of passives. Really nicely laid out board though. Really gives a good demonstration of a single layer PCB. Oh, that's interesting. That's one of my first indications to, to who may have made this. Uh, a lot of this branding is to do with a local installer, so it's not actually the manufacturer. And that, as far as I know, is my first concrete evidence of uh, a manufacturer. It's interesting that the brightness and contrast uh, and the volume buttons on the side are actually part of this display sub-module. Oh, look. <laughs> The, uh, the backlight for the LCDs and actually two little incandescent lamps that are soldered straight onto the board. So I imagine they got really hot and probably went some way to destroying the screen not long after it was used. This little display module, tiny little thing. Look. Just touching it, it's fragile enough that I can actually activate it sure I'm doing it all sorts of damage. But this is the bit I'm really interested in, the RF unit. Now, as I say, these would have been, or appear to have been, I'm not that much of an authority on this technology, but from the research I've done, this appears to be a reasonably standard unit used by a lot of manufacturers and suppliers. So I'm expecting this top plate just to come off in one go. 
this is purely cosmetic, doesn't serve any actual function. The big heatsink, on the other hand, I have a feeling probably will. So on the side here, we've got the RJ45 connection for the handset, four core power to the car, and your RF outlet, uh, RF outlet, <laughs> the antenna connection. Um, it's interesting, there is one single antenna, and these units, in the UK at least, used uh, eight to 900 megahertz, um, and the wavelength of that will tell you just how big the antenna on the car needed to be to it to work. Okay. Ooh. Very nice. So, this half with the heatsink attached to it and the antenna connection, I'm going to go ahead and assume is the radio equipment. Down here, this is all the integrated circuitry. Got a couple of crystals, uh, one socketed dip, dip um, IC. I'm guessing this is going to be the software or, or the firmware. Uh, and it's probably socketed because this was replaced and upgraded regularly. Uh, that will be a software version, I would expect, written on the chip. So let's try and get that sticker off later and see, uh, see if we can work out if it's an um, EEPROM or something. Now, these insulation displacement connectors, this back side of them looks very, very similar to um, like a hard drive ribbon or a floppy ribbon, uh, the, the old IDE style anyway. Um, but the fact that I can see those rectangular IDC receivers makes me think that this is actually permanently pressed onto the board. It's not going to be a pin removal. So I'm probably going to end up destroying it, trying to get it, <laughs> trying to get it out. Yeah, and sure enough, you can see the back of the uh, pins. So those would have been punched in in the factory, this little plastic receiver pressed on top. And as you punch this down, uh, it actually makes a hole in the insulation so you can get the connection right through it. I don't suppose I'm going to have any more luck with this one. I have destroyed that already. Our okay. shield's starting to... Ooh. Okay, more RF shielding and more radio equipment. Oh, look. <laughs> I was trying to work out if I could what the possible use of the two sides are and I, I should just learn to read. Written right here on the RF shielding for the antenna connection are RX and TX, transmit and receive, which I should have realised really. The frequencies that it used to receive on because um, this used analog communication for the voice transmission and receiving, um, which is why in certain films of a certain age you can see people getting a crossed line, um, which was only possible with the analog 1G system. Uh, it's never been possible with the digital system. Each radio tower could receive approximately 600 phone calls, and each one of those was given a 2.5 megahertz window for that phone call to be made. And they had a band of frequencies, I think it was 825 megahertz and up, for transmit, I think it was 950 and up for receive. Don't quote me on that, and of course it will vary country to country, but they had distinct frequencies and it was one frequency for transmit, and one for receive. And in this case, that's our receive, this is our transmit. Yay! Finally liberated, there we go. There are some very, very expired thermal interface material. So thermal grease. I don't suppose that's doing any good anymore, but just connected to a copper heat spreader onto the case with the heat sink. So I've gone away and spent some time looking up the ICs on these boards to try and work out how they function a little bit better. Uh, it's surprisingly simple. I thought it was going to be really complicated and hard to follow and work out, but actually it's kind of straightforward. Um, if I start with the handset, these two large ICs up here are display drivers. I hadn't realised that it classifies the top half and the bottom half of the LCD as two different displays and needs two drivers. Up here we have a 3.5 MHz 8-bit CPU driving the whole thing. And of course down here we have an amplifier needed for the loudspeaker or the speaker. Most of what you see is to do with multiplexing, modulating and audio. Uh, this little chip on the door board over here is a high quality signal synthesizer. 
So that will be used for on the transmit side for modulating the voice signals onto the carrier frequency. This I was particularly worried about. I wasn't really sure how this was going to go but it's reasonably simple. Again, it's all just signal manipulation. We've got a main processor over here. These two chips are um, high, frequent, uh, high quality signal generators, so they're used for modulating the voice. Down here, you've got um, a digital signal generator, which I hadn't realized you'd need without digital communications. You're basically using touch tone dialing. So that's actually used to create the frequencies which send the signals over the analog signal to tell it which number you're dialing. And otherwise it's just a lot of signal handling. It's really straightforward. Um, and I was right, this is electronically erasable memory, so that would hold the soft software which drives the processor and everything on it. And when you compare that to the Snapdragon 800 system on a chip over here, which just, I think, literally puts everything over there into perspective. I'm still not really sure why I found this as a comparison quite so interesting. Uh, I think the age of the electronics in the old car phone are just old enough that it's not sort of analog transmission uh, and passives, it's actually some integrated circuits, but it's still simple enough that you can follow it. Whereas when you get to the modern generation and everything's just a single package and thousands of pins that you've never got any hope of working out, I feel like it's kind of lost some of its fun. Well, I hope you've enjoyed it too, and uh, if you have an idea that you'd like to see torn down in the future, let us know over at the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.